Your four minutes begins now. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for having me here. The Poor People's Campaign and the Moral Revival and the Moral Poor People's Budget that has been proposed is part of a large cultural impulse that is rubbing up from the bottom of things in America today. And I think at a certain point, the question is not what are the policymakers going to do. At a certain point, and this is the point, the question is what are we going to do. And I believe that it is time for us to recognize that we need a revolution in America. <clears throat> we need a moral and a poli political and an economic revolution in America. You know, every time that we read something like a quote from Luke or from Amos, and it says that God will deliver the oppressed, we talk a lot here about the deliverance. We're not talking quite enough these days about the oppression. And when we talk about the fact that there is violence from public policy, that is exactly the expression, Reverend, Reverend Barber. It is policy violence because the economic system in America today is a system of economic tyranny. The economic system that prevails in America today does not just ignore the poor. It does not just turn a blind eye to the poor. There is a systemic war on the poor in America. And there is a reason for that. And that is because the kind of capital capitalism that is being practiced in America today, an unfettered capitalism with no sense of moral or ethical responsibility to anything beyond its fiduciary responsibility to its stockholders, with no sense of moral or ethical responsibility to the larger stakeholders of the workers and the communities and the environment, needs cheap labor. It needs cheap labor. This isn't a matter of, come on, guys, don't be so greedy. This isn't a matter of, come on, guys, don't be so selfish. This is a matter of us standing up and recognizing in America we don't do aristocracy. In 1776, this country was founded in repudiation of a system in which only a few people got the goods. Only a few people had the right and the entitlement to own land, to own wealth, to own the means of wealth creation, and to own education. Everybody else was a little more than a serf, not that far high above a slave. With this country, ladies and gentlemen, we repudiated aristocracy, and it is time for us to repudiate it again. Because what is happening in America today is what, such that for the last 40 years, we have been moving in a grand theft. It is a theft, ladies and gentlemen. It is a grand theft of the public resources of this country away from a broad-scale embodiment and actualization of American democracy, the idea that all men are created equal, the idea that God gave, God gave unalienable rights of life and of liberty and the pursuit of happiness to all men, and that governments are here to secure those rights. Instead, the government is now handmaiden. It is little more than a system of legalized bribery, handmaiden with the very corporate matrix of multinational corporate capitalism, which too often gives us only what crumbs will fall from their table. And too many American politicians are coming to the likes of this crowd and saying, I can get you more than crumbs. I can get you a cookie. We need to stop asking for a cookie and saying in America, all people are able to feast. All people are able to feast. <laughs> the American people have stopped got to stop asking pretty please. The American people are stop, got to stop asking, oh, That's please, your could time. we? That the is American your time. people need to remember this is America. Thank you. We all matter. Thank you very Thank much. You. Come and have a seat right here in the hot seat. Bishop Barber, would you like to start? So we're glad to have you with us here Thank today. Thank you, Reverend. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So I'm a Southern boy. Yep. Um, Virginia, North Carolina. Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Florida, uh, Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee. And in those states and some others outside of the South, since 2010, we've seen systemic policy racism through racist voter suppression and gerrymandering like we haven't seen since Jim Crow. And it, is, it allows a controlling of the Congress, controlling of state houses. But when we look underneath that, 
We also notice that those same states that people get elected in via racist voter suppression, surgical racism, those same states are the highest poverty state, not black poverty, highest poverty state, highest child poverty, highest women in poverty, lowest wages, lowest union density, lowest access to health care, in fact, sometimes outright denial of health care, greatest attack on women, greatest attack on the LGBT community and immigrants. And too often what we see is we continue to fight on our silos without recognizing these interlocking injustices. How will your campaign and how will your administration run in a way that, number one, does not run away from the South and the hard work of building interracial coalitions between blacks, whites, Latinos, uh, uh, and Native Americans in the South? And how will your campaign, your administration, show people the interconnectedness so that we stop pitting this white against black and brown, but help build the kind of coalition where black and brown and white, poor and low wealth people come together, as Dr. King once said, to build a beloved community and to transform this country? There has been a great propaganda uh, effort to divide us. This has been going on for 40 years. It has been part of the psychological and emotional mind game that has led us to where we are. The average American, I believe, is a good person, and I don't believe the average American is a racist person. I believe the average American believes in decency, but the average American is woefully undereducated about the history of race in this country and even the history of our country itself. So I believe, as a person, it is not an accident that the abolitionist movement arose from the early evangelicals. It is not an accident that Dr. King was a Baptist preacher. It is not an accident, sir, you and Reverend Theo Harris. This is a religious and revival movement. I am a woman who comes from the religious and the spiritual sector as well. And I understand that the people in the South do answer. And part of the problem with the Democratic Party over the last few years is that it has been afraid. It has spoken with arrogance and condescension to communities of faith. Too often the Republicans don't walk their talk, but the Democrats don't talk their walk. I am not afraid to say that we must do these things because God would have us love each other. I'm not afraid to say that God would have us do these things because that is what we are on the earth to do. And I am not afraid to say that you cannot go forward in life without cleaning up the past. That is why, for instance, that I talk about reparations for slavery and have been doing so since 1997. Thank you, ma'am. Hold your applause, hold on. Whether it is the Catholics going to confession, whether it is the Jews on the holiest day of the year, the day of Yom Kippur, or whether it is, or whether it is in Alcoholics Anonymous when people take a fearless moral inventory and, ex and admit the exact nature of their character defects. I'm running because America needs to have a more brutally honest conversation with itself about our own character defects, such as racism, okay. such as militarism, and such as our streak of meanness with which to Often but I, I want to get at something beyond the meanness and beyond the cultural racism. There's a new book out called Stamp from the Beginning. Yes. And it says that policy comes before the cultural racism. My question really is, your campaign, your presidency, how will you address the policy racism that, number one, often isn't talked about? <clears throat> uh, for instance, voting rights is seen as a black issue not as an issue, a living wage issue, not as an LGBTQ issue, not as a women's rights issue. So for instance, you can have a state where you'll have a rising of women and should be against abortion or against or gay people, against the LGBT community, and corporations pull out, but they don't pull out when the racist voter suppression allows the people to get in office that then pass the policies against the LGBTQ community. And when we have to find a way to connect policy racism and the disparate impact where people may never be mean to you outwardly, may never call you an ugly name, may never say the N-word, but every day they are implementing policies that are imbued with disparate impact. 
They are, sir, and what we have to understand and to admit to ourselves is how often the people who have done that have also been Democrats. We have had Democrats who have expressed moral equivocation. If you're a Democrat, you appoint a, a, an attorney general who not only understands about systemic racism in your criminal sentencing, who not only understands about uh, racial disparities in our economics, who not only understands about racial disparity in voting rights, but actually does something about it. And and doesn't pretend that you can do that if you're also playing footsies under the table with the people who represent the forces of multicultural, uh, multinational corporate dominance that would rather have it the way it is. I have no moral equivocation. And if you vote for me for president, by definition, that means you're ready for me to say we're going to have reparations for slavery, not just because of the economic force, but because of the spiritual and moral force that comes from the recognition that damage has been done, a wrong has been done, a debt is owed, and it shall now be paid. Uh, I'm going to switch up the order just a little bit and get the audience in. Reverend Dr. Terry Hoard Owens, where are you? Okay, there. Hello. Please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Williamson, for your thank time you. with us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is the Reverend Terry Hoard Owens, and I am the General Minister and President of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the U.S. and Canada, and I am here today with Rabbi Michael Pollock from Pennsylvania. In my tradition, I follow a homeless and undocumented man who preached the good news to the poor. And yet today, too many in power have distorted our religious teachings and our most precious moral values. They say that we live in a time of scarcity and they use religion to support policies of social and economic violence. Today, we released a moral budget that makes it clear that we have more than enough to go around and that creating national budgets and policies around the needs of the poor is not only possible, but will benefit the larger society. As president, how would you transform our national budget priority to meet the needs of the 140 million poor and low-income people in this country? Money does not come from a bunch of aristocrats who take all the money and say that it will trickle down to lift all boats. Clearly that has not only uh, not trickled down, it has left millions of people without even a life vest. I would repeal the 2017 tax cut that gives 83 cents of every dollar to the very richest among us. I would put back in the, the middle class tax cuts. I would repeal the corporate subsidies such as that which gave 26 billion dollars to the fossil companies, uh, fossil fuel companies alone. I would do the 386 billion uh, cutting off of the military budget because that military budget does not represent our, our legitimate security needs. It represents short-term profits for defense contractors and an endless preparation of war as opposed to real peace building. And every dollar that you spend on education and health does much more to create jobs than does military expenditure. And I would also put a 3% tax on billionaires and a 2% tax on everyone who has $500 million and more. And I would say to you, who are a Christian, and you, sir, who are a Jew, it wasn't just the resurrection, it was also the crucifixion. It wasn't just the deliverance to the promised land, it was the slavery in Egypt. We have to realize, as important as it is that we be immoral, it is also important that we remember that the forces of immorality are on the march as well. We must stop asking and we must start demanding. And that is a shift inside ourselves, and it will change this country. Thank you very much. Um, Reverend Theo Harris. So we in the Poor People's Campaign have, have put out these figures that there's 140 million people who are poor and low income, that there's 15 million people who cannot afford water, that there's thousands and thousands of communities who do not have proper infrastructure, that there's 62 million folks uh, working jobs that pay less than a living wage, and that there's no county across this country where you can actually afford a two-bedroom apartment if you're working for a minimum wage. So. We, we can make a connection between all of these, and, and we say that it's not the fault of, of people, um, but structures. And so what are your, your proposals for structural immediate change to, to 
to confront these problems of racism, of poverty, of <clears throat> ecological devastation, and of this war economy? First of all, I certainly affirm it's not about wicked individuals. This is about rotten systems. But if all we do is think that we're going to fix it by defeating Donald Trump, they'll be back in 22. They'll be back in 24. And if all we do is fix things on the level of the symptom, then all that has to happen is that they can come back and repeal it with the next president. I would do what any of the such as Bernie Sanders, such as Anne Elizabeth Warren. I'm from the progressive left wing of the Democratic Party who believes that we need a fundamental pattern disruption of the economic and political status quo of the United States. However, by doing such things as I mentioned before, and if anybody were to elect me by definition, that would be understood. But none of this will ultimately fundamentally change on a causal level until you and I remember who this country belongs to. We need a moral and a spiritual revival and a psychological revival and an emotional revival so that we get to the point there's enough of a critical mass of American people who feel that fierce thing that rises up when we say to whoever we need to say it to you did it to my grandparents and you're not gonna do it to my kids um, I have a quick follow-up just to, to bring together all of the, the the questions that you were asked we've experienced for the last two and a half years an quote outsider president with no political experience yes um, who comes into Washington <laughs> saying I'm going to make fundamental change. Right. But if you look at the policies that the current president has input, he's been able to do them because they were what Republicans in Congress already wanted to do. Big tax cuts, that's something they already wanted to do. Maybe they didn't want to do the tariffs, but they're a bit afraid to say no, right? So so that he's been able to move, Not he hasn't moved the party, he simply signed the bills. Right. On the Democratic side, it's a little bit different. The progressive side of the party is not what is in charge generally of the party. So how would you come in as an outsider and get these ideas <clears throat> through Congress, both parties, and then what would you do about trying to get them through a United States Senate where Mitch McConnell has vowed to stop anything? particularly anything progressive that comes his way. Well, you know as well as I do that if I'm elected president, that means the American people have wakened up in certain ways, that they're thinking a certain way, which will then be reflected not only in who they elect to the presidency, but who they elect to Congress and who they elect to the Senate. Any Democrat coming in is hoping, hoping that Mitch McConnell will not be the head of the Senate at that time. However, because of the things I'm saying, because I'm really laying it down, because I'm getting honest and not pussyfooting and not talking some moral equivalent stuff from people who have already proven they're not going to change it because they would have changed it by now, I will have already let the cat out of the bag. So that then, even if we don't get it when I'm there in those first two years or four years, the American people will take it from there. Well, yeah, please do. I want to, um, one follow-up, and, and I understand those of you in the audience, the discipline of listening, but it's a powerful discipline, and it actually says more sometimes than applauding particular pieces, because the, the issue is, it's the whole. So here's the question, and I'm, I thank you for um, the words, uh, Mary, and, and, and the insights. It does take the people, but we also have to change Pharaoh. We also have to change Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, it took the people to fight and push for unions and social security, but it also took a president to, to push those into, into being. It took changing a president to get legislation for voting rights. In fact, they did it in, in a non-election year. So the people changed the political contour even in a non-election year, but forced politicians who were elected not to do something to end up having to do, but they needed them to be in the place to force them to do it. But here's the question. Will your campaign, will you, because they're gonna, there were 26 debates in 2016, televised. There are 140 million poor people, 43.5% of this country, Voter suppression like we haven't seen since the days of Jim Crow. 66 million white people alone that are poor. 50, uh, a third of the poor people are in the South. 13 million uninsured people in the South. And not one debate, one hour, was on poverty. And not one hour was on racialized voter suppression and the other forms of racism that connect to the oppression and hurting of people of all colors. Will you push the powers that be that are setting up the debates 
to have a debate where the focus is on systemic policy racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and militarism, and this false moral narrative of religious nationalism that has moved its way into the White House and is actually helping to set policy. Will you push for that, and how will you push for it? Not only would I, I already have. As everybody's been talking in the last couple of weeks about why don't we have a climate debate, I've talked about why don't we have a poverty debate. I'm the only person who, in every one of my campaign stops, talks about the chronic trauma of millions of American children be, while their despair is merely normalized by the political establishment and why I want a U.S. cabinet, a department of children and youth. I'm the only one talking about the military industrial complex other than Tulsi Gabbard and talking about how we need a department of peace. I'm the only one out there talking about reparations and mass incarceration. I'm the only one out there talking about the poverty rate and child poverty. I not only have, sir, but I have not had as much of a megaphone to do that because we have a political media industrial complex that seeks to perpetuate its dominance by having only the conversation that they are already having. And therefore, I can push and I can push, but I need your help as much as you need my help because the voices of the people are ready and the conduits and the megaphones are not prepared to receive that conversation as they should be. Well, you have the megaphone right now. Good. Thank you, Joy. Um, we are uh, live streaming this. This can be seen Thank all you. over the world, anywhere where somebody has an internet connection. So, so give us, you know, in a nutshell, what is the purpose of your campaign? You obviously, as you said, running as an outsider. You're not as well known um, as some of the other <coughs> candidates. You don't have a history in politics. In order to make the things happen that you've talked about, you yes. actually have to become president. Yes. It's not easy to do. Yes. A, how would you, how do you plan to do that? And B, what is your larger platform that speaks to those 140 million people who are low income and poor in this country? My larger platform is that we need an economic, social, and moral, and, and, econ and political revolution in this country. John Kennedy said that those who make a peaceful revolution impossible make a violent revolution inevitable. We need a pattern disruption of the political and the economic status quo in this country, which has no intention of giving anyone here any more than some crumbs because they happen to be made to do it in any particular election. We need to remember that no one in America should be considered an outsider. That's the problem right there. This elite system of politicians who claim to be the only ones qualified. I challenge the idea that only the people whose careers have been entrenched in the system that brought us into this ditch are the only ones qualified to lead us out of this ditch. The abolitionists but when uh, abolitionists didn't, the, the political establishment did not wake up and say, let's, let's free the slaves. Abolitionists meant the people stepped in. The political establishment did not wake up and say, let's give women the right to vote. Mm -mm. It was the women suffragettes when the people stepped in. The political establishment didn't wake up and say, let's desegregate the South. It was the civil rights movement. The people stepped in. It is time once again for the people to step in. This is why I talk about the chronic trauma of millions of American children who go to school in classrooms that do not even have adequate school supplies with which to teach a child to read. And if a child cannot read by the age of eight, the chances of, of high school graduation are drastically diminished and the chances of incarceration are drastically increased. I talk about the fact that it's all well and good that we need Medicare for all, but we also have to talk about the fact that our food policies and our chemical policies and our agricultural policies and our environmental policies are making us sick, particularly in disadvantaged communities. We need to talk about the fact that we must wage peace as much as wage war, which is why we need more money given to the peace builders and not just the war makers. And we need to talk about the fact that until we deal with the real truth of systemic racism in our criminal justice systems and our economic systems and our social systems, particularly with the paying of reparations for slavery, we will not have expunged from our national psyche and our national heart those shades of darkness which God would be glad to remove from us once we give them to him. All right. Well, we, we the last remaining minutes, there are two young people, two children, two kids, where are you guys, who were going, who wanted to ask a question, so I want to see if we can get them to come on quickly, 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 and ask and, your question. There they are. And this is the time to clap now. Clap now. Now you can clap. Yeah. Get it all out. Get it all out. Okay, don't be shy. Tell us your names, and then, and your ages, and your question. Go ahead. My name is Azarea, and I'm nine years old. And my question is, Thank you. 
My question is, why are the needles all around our school? Why are? Why are the needles, needles around your school? Around. Okay. Needles around her school. <clears throat> needles are around your school because there are people doing things that are very, very bad for them. And they're doing things that are very bad for them because life is so hard for them and the pain is so great that they don't even want to be here anymore. And our job, and it'll be your job when you grow up, and all of us are going to do it now, is to create a society in which more people are happy and more people aren't desperate and more people just want to do good, happy, peaceful things. But until then, there will be things like needles, and that's why we're all here, because we're going to give people justice and jobs and all the things that make their lives meaningful, and then they'll be happy and they will not be using needles. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Jada Rackard. I'm from Boston, Mass, and I'm 10 years old and I'm going into the sixth grade. This last year has been tough for me, not because my schoolwork is challenging or I'm worrying about my grades. I didn't have a tough year because I was worried about MCAS or failing a test. I, was, I wasn't even worried about being teased by other kids and making new friends. I went to school every day worried about getting pricked by a needle on school grounds. I worry about my friends that are not as fortunate as me to be able to be dropped off to school daily. The things that they see or even being approached by a stranger, we, we are a mile away. We are a mile away from not one, not two, but three method, methadone clinics. Some of us see people walking up and down the street. I see people walking like zombies, like from a movie, and almost falling down, and it scares me. This past year, I have spoke to many people about the needles. I have spoken to our school committee, city councilors. I've even asked Congresswoman Ayanna Presley for a meeting. I have helped organize cleanups with my mother and other parents. They say I'm an activist. I say I'm just a 10-year-old little girl that wants to go to school and learn, play, and make memories with my friends. They continue to give me more and more money with the opioid epidemic and continue to pull funds away from my housing and education. So if you ask me what I'm fighting for, I'm fighting for my life and my community. How are you fighting for us? Thank you. Very well done. We'll give you a, we're over, but very quickly if you could answer, very quickly. Good job, young ladies. Good job. Let's Very give it good. up for her. Very good. Both of you did a great job. Very quickly. Millions of American children live in what's called America's mess domestic war zones. They are in every 50 state. Psychologists say that the PTSD of a returning uh, uh, veteran from Afghanistan and Iraq is no more horrific than the, than the PTSD of these children. We need wraparound services. We need trauma-informed education. We are also the m only advanced industrial nation that makes property taxes the primary source of our funding. Every school in America should be a palace of learning and culture and the arts. <laughs> of New Zealand says New Zealand is the best place for a child to be raised. I will call her immediately and say, girl, when you're on, America should be the best Thank place you for a child. Thank you so much. Thank you.